I think Hong Kong has taken a very strict approach. So now I'm on a 14-day quarantine. I have a GPS tracker. First comes the awareness, and then comes the action. We are looking at the consequences of not looking ahead and preparing well for a crisis. Of course, now we find ourselves in uncharted waters. It's a fun challenge. Yesterday, I could go to see my mom because they live 10 kilometers away. And she's alone, oh, okay. actually, because my dad is stuck oh. in Lapland. My dad went ski doing with his friends. And no way. he got stuck there. He got stuck there. So he's been up there since six weeks. Wow. In a, in a little wow. uh, wood chalet in Lapland. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he can't get back down anymore. He's well, he will never forget. He will never forget no, it. No, no, certainly sure. not. But he's completely stuck. So, um, yeah. So well, I, but yesterday was the first time I could go see my mom, uh, 10, 10 kilometers away. Uh, so that was good. quite nice. But, uh, yeah. So we're good, waiting, good. waiting on Jamie. Huh? Oh, Jamie's there. Okay. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Hey, Thank you. Uh, Look at us, you. guys, with our uniforms. This Jamie and I are really eh? professional, professional stuff. Mm-hmm. Alejandro, Jamie, thanks so much for joining my Leaders for Good series. Uh, you're also doing a lot of good, hence why I wrote you. So I really appreciate. Uh, Alejandro, if I may, if I may start, where are you at? And uh, and then also I wanted to ask uh, subsequently. Um, usually you're like flat out going from one meeting to another and one event to another. How are you dealing with actually being locked down? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it's very strange. I am in London. I'm in London in my house with my wife, with the kids. And, um, you know, I usually take between four and six planes a week. Um, and this was kind of a sudden stop. I actually almost got trapped. I was, I was visiting a location for Extreme in uh, Namibia. And uh, on the way back, South Africa closed the borders. So I go to the airport, I couldn't, I had to go via, almost via the luggage corridor in the back to to, to catch the British Airways flight to go back to London. And I got here and they just shut down London. So I've been in my house. It's very strange. But you know, it's, I think we will all remember this in in, in years and we will, we will remember. This is one thing that happens one time every hundred years. So now you've taken up meditation to deal with it or what? Yeah, I'm doing, uh, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I tell you, (laughs) I I think I'm going to, I go, I have a little um, uh, guest house on the other side of the garden and I go there like if it was the airport, you know, and I, I, I almost going to take my trolley there to get the feeling of, of, of going somewhere. Oh my God. It's, uh, it's Jamie, you look like you're in a warm place. Where, where are you at? And I am in my, uh, on the roof of my apartment in Hong Kong. So I, I don't have as exotic of a story as Alejandro, but I was in Singapore and then as Singapore uh, started to have lockdown, we came back to our place in Hong Kong. So now I'm on a 14-day quarantine. I have a GPS tracker and I can't leave my apartment. But, uh, wow, no I way. I came up to the roof to, uh, to chat with you. So. Is there something we can learn in Europe from that kind of GPS tracker, do you think? No, huh? Well, look, I, I think Hong Kong has taken a very, uh, very strict approach, right? So you have um, no uh, non-resident visitors and you have a mandatory test when you arrive in the airport, and then you have a 14-day quarantine in your apartment with a GPS tracker. The police have come to our house uh, three times in two weeks to check in and make sure my, uh, my family is all here. So it's a very strict regime, but then after 14 days, uh, you, can, you can go and experience Hong Kong, and they've had, in the last week, they've had three days with zero new cases. So they have it under control, um, but it's but it's obviously a very strict uh, strict policy. So I think it depends on the uh, society rules and the government whether uh, whether people would accept that. But it's working here. Yeah, well, sounds sounds good. Huh? I mean, sounds crazy extreme, but sounds sounds good. Um, if I can ask you for um, you, to your CEO role, so you joined C- uh, as CEO formally a couple of months ago. Alejandro, I guess, uh, was very instrumental as well in in asking you to join. Um, how has it been then? Can you give us a bit of an insight into the first couple of months? How you found it? What has been the most amazing and the most difficult thing? Maybe the two uh, two extremes. Sure. I mean, look, uh, Alejandro was a big part of bringing me on board, and the partnership with him is is super important to me. I said it to him in uh, my first interview. I really uh, was excited to try to build the uh, build on the foundations he's established and to learn from him. One of the one of the great entrepreneurs. So, so I guess the pleasant surprise is the caliber of the people and the team that that he had built. Um, you know, it's really an incredible product with, uh, with Formula E that, uh, that's been constructed. The level of support from the ecosystem. I think it's really rare in sports where you have 
um, the level of commitment from all the, the stakeholders, and they're all paddling in the same direction, right? Often in sport, it's a little bit more zero sum between uh, the stakeholders. With Formula E, everyone's on the, uh, on the same page. Um, the surprises, I mean, look, it, it, before March, uh, we were dealing with calendar challenges. We were dealing with protests in Hong Kong. We were dealing with the usual things about trying to put on a, a global championship. Of course, now we find ourselves in, in uncharted waters, uh, but we're in, in the situation of many others. So we're trying to figure out how do we keep our product relevant and how do we keep growing? So uh, it's a fun challenge. It's, yeah, uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit again in, in just a second. Alejandro, I just wanted to go back to you. You, you, you. you gave your baby into Jamie's hands. How hard has that been for you? And have you been able to uh, give Jamie some breathing space in the meantime? You know, uh, um... You know, the, the key really, I mean, for breathing space, uh, that's no problem. I love to give breathing space. Uh, I, I kind of uh, love to disappear. But, you know, uh, without the joke, uh, you know, the key really is to have uh, people around you that do things better than you. Uh, and, uh, and I think this, since Jamie arrived, is doing a fantastic job as CEO. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not really my speciality, if you know what I mean. So I, I'm more of a founder. Uh, of, a, of a kind of maybe a starter of things, uh, but uh, but you know there is people who do the, the the job of CEO much better than me. And Jamie's an example; he's doing a great job. And you know it's it's really um, I think working very well the partnership between both of us. Uh, you know I I am now chairman, which is a position I like a lot. Um, so it's 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 less hands on, uh, and and of course I'm dedicating time to some other things. But I'm still really uh, you know. Uh, focused and, and very kind of like uh, active in Formula A uh, whenever I'm needed. And then, uh, you know, we, we talk, Jamie and I, all the time. And, and, and sometimes it's, okay, you go after that thing I, and I take care of this and we split uh, some things. But, uh, you know, definitely all the day today is now on, on Jamie's hands with the team, with Alberto, with Enrique, and I really enjoy that. So that's, that's, uh, they're doing a great job. The baby is in good hands. <laughs> That's nice to hear. It's a nice quote how you say that you love to have people around you that are better than you in the different areas. That's really powerful. Yeah, it's very important powerful to hear that. So, Jamie, is it true? You got the, you got the breathing space? Well, it's funny. So, uh, I remember around Christmas time, you know, I went into this job and there was sort of this interesting thing where you're coming in after an iconic founder and you think, you know, do you want to be the first one who has that job? That's, that's, that's a big, big challenge and a big opportunity. Um, at Christmas, I said to my wife and I said to my family, I said, you know, Alejandro is really hands off more than I expected given, given that it's his baby. But now when we're in our house, because he doesn't have as much going on, he's very active with us, which I think is really good because, because we're navigating, we're navigating some really, uh, really difficult times, right? And, and having yeah. his counsel and his advice and his energy is super valuable. So, you know, it, as he said, it, it, it's working quite well in terms of the balance and the reality is he, he's really uh, good at some things that, that I'm not great at. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy some things that maybe he's less interested in. So, so far, so good. So a key, yeah. learning, a key learning for you, Jamie, is you have to find some big picture topics for Alejandro to keep him busy, right? Right. That's right. He's, <laughs> there's, there's always new ideas coming, which is uh, which keeps us hard. Jamie, what's the latest then on the, on the Formula E uh, kickoff? What are we looking at at the moment? Well, you know, if we, uh, if we do this interview again in a couple of days, it could change. But generally speaking, you know, we've been quite fortunate in the sense that we've already had five of our 14 races. Um, and we were very early and very decisive in putting the season on pause, um, what we're calling the red flag, yellow flag system. Um, so right now we're working to a plan in, uh, in late July and, and August to try to return to racing. I mean, we don't want to be so explicit and announce anything because nothing's confirmed. But generally speaking, we're looking at uh, trying to complete the season with another four to six races in, uh, in, the, uh, in the late summer uh, and into September. And the view there is you complete the season and then, we can shift to planning for, for what we call season seven, which starts at the end of uh, 2020. So you can't name one race where you think, okay, at the moment, that's the most likely? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've been on record. We're having conversations uh, in replacing London with a race in the UK. Um, so we're talking to tracks. Um, I think that's kind of a big change, right? So the DNA of Formula E is generally to race in city center. So we're talking to a number of tracks in the UK. We're looking also at Berlin and whether we can do Tempelhof. Uh, at a later date, depending on you know the regulations there, uh, it would obviously be behind closed doors, given the number of people. And then uh, you know our race in, in Korea, uh, 
we're we're in deep conversations with uh, with Seoul about trying to make that happen again this year. But but nothing nothing's confirmed, Nico. Yeah, it's been a big blow to my projects as well, because uh, for those who are listening, we, we have a partnership in Berlin because I have the Green Tech Festival, which I created there, which is a, a platform uh, to, to help preserve the environment. Um, and of course, since Formula E now also got postponed, we had to postpone our festival. So we're now due to host it in, uh, in autumn and uh, most likely on our own as well, which is going to be a different situation. But nevertheless, also there. Um, plannings are proceeding well for us, so um, so we're quite fortunate there. Um, Alejandro, um, you're at the same time as trying to help uh, Jamie with Formula E now. You've been launching an incredible new startup as well uh, called Extreme E. Um, yeah. Can you give us a, a quick uh, update on that and also what the main purpose is um, that you hope yes. to achieve with that? So the, the, update, uh, the update on Extreme E is uh, everything is uh, going ahead. So we, we are still on track. We, are, we had a small, two small hiccups. Uh, one is uh, the cars got a little bit delayed, the production of the cars, because they shut down the factory in France. The factory now is reopened, and the cars you know, are, are now being assembled. So we're going to get the cars, maybe with a month, a month and a half delay. Uh, we were going to get them in August. We're going to get them in, in October. And uh, the boat, uh, the, the, the big ship, uh, that is going to be the floating paddock. You see, you smile. You'll get on that boat. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get you on that boat. <laughs> the boat uh, also um, was in the shipyard in Liverpool, 90% finished when they shut down the shipyard. So we still have 10% to go. The shipyard is still closed, but we still only have like two or three more weeks of work on the ship. Um, so we, we expect as soon as they open the shipyard again in a month uh, or a month and a half, we'll finish the ship. What we're probably going to do, we're, 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 we're going to make an announcement soon. We may delay the first race by four to six weeks. So we are working on, on adjustment so to give us a little bit more buffer on the logistics. But uh, that's it. Everything is going ahead with Extreme. It's very exciting. And I think the role of Extreme is more relevant than ever because, of course, after COVID, uh, there is going to be the temptation of forget about uh, the environment and about the fight against climate change. But the environment and the climate change are not going anywhere. The problem is still there. And Actually, now we are looking at the consequences of not looking ahead and preparing well for a crisis. And one crisis that we know for sure is coming is climate change. So we need to prepare more than ever. So I think the relevance of any activity, and Extreme is one more of the activities, Formula E, of course, is a very, very important activity, but many other people are, 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 are you know, working on this field uh, against climate change. Every activity is more and more important now because we cannot lose the focus climate change is coming so and of course now we're very worried about covid but once covid is over all the all the uh, you know efforts need to continue going against the fight against climate change and getting prepared for climate change we need long-term planning that's that's what we need you, sp you spoke about activities a little bit of a tangent here what do you think soccer could do because we're, we're talking a little bit what motorsport from lee is doing and extremely what can soccer do which has such incredible reach uh, to also f help the fight for climate change against climate change you know, I think uh, every sport uh, has to do something and can do something. Of course, soccer cannot be played on a more sustainable way or the, the, the ball cannot be filled of hydrogen that is whatever. You know, you cannot find a technology link between soccer and climate change, but soccer can help raise awareness. And the players especially can help raise that awareness. The players are huge um, examples or idols for many, many millions of people, many young people, uh, many not young people, they, they love these players. If the players start pushing the message of awareness about climate change, that will be super important because this is a chain. First comes the awareness and then comes the action. The awareness has to come from people who have the impact and football players have it. Then the action will come from the business and the industry. But business and industry will only act when the public opinion is convinced and the players can help convince the public opinion. Yeah, but it, uh, raising awareness without substance is always a bit difficult. Huh? They would need to join forces on, on a project, on something where they're really changing the planet themselves, I believe, just as you're doing with Formula E. Don't you think that's a really important part of it? I think it would be great. I think if, if they can give a kind of real sense to their action, even better. If they join an action, even better. But people will, will, will look because they are the players. So they're, they're super right. famous and they're super admired. So if they can find a project, and football as a whole could do it, even the FIFA or UEFA or the leagues or the clubs, I don't know how they could do it. If they find one project that they can all support, that can then also 
bring the attention to the problem, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you can, you can come up with an idea, Nico. Well, no, but Jamie has just done it. Jamie, you just did it with UNICEF. So you just, uh, maybe you can give us a few details on that. Uh, I think it's been fantastic, your partnership with UNICEF. And I think what the, what, what the listeners would love to, to hear is a concrete example as well of where you've now already seen that your partnership has, has uh, um, fruited into a, a concrete help. Well, look, I mean, and Formula E has always had this, this underlying purpose to uh, accelerate electric vehicle adoption and, and address climate change, right? I mean, that was Alejandro's kind of insight was the link between climate change and sport and the power of sport to, to inspire. So when COVID happened, you know, obviously there was a period of initial operational reality that we had to plan through, but then we thought as a group, how can we really have an impact here? And I'm a huge believer in the power of sport to tell stories, right? I mean, as Alejandro is saying with football, it's a huge platform. So we have a platform as well. But the challenge we have is we don't have the ability to deliver projects on a global scale. I mean, fundamentally, we're still a pretty small company. And so we were looking for a partner who shared values and who could deliver globally. And this challenge around COVID, like climate change, is truly global, right? It's affecting, there's two and a half billion people around the world who are currently sitting at home. And so it's a global platform, or excuse me, a global challenge. And so UNICEF was the ideal partner because they can deliver globally. We're aligned with them from a philosophical perspective in terms of the focus on next uh, generations and, and youth. And, you know, we're making a small contribution financially, but then we're using our marketing platform to help them tell stories and inspire. Uh, and then they do the work in the cities around the world. Yeah, so I was just looking at your Instagram and you were sitting on your sofa watching uh, all of your race drivers uh, do a virtual race at home uh, uh, con uh, challenge. Uh, and that was also for UNICEF. Can you tell us about the impact from that? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the esports thing obviously is, uh, you know, come up the attention uh, grade pretty dramatically in the last month. And, you know, again, we, we looked at a lot of the activity that motorsports were doing and we thought, how can we be different, right? We really wanted to make sure we had a distinct product um, because there's a lot of things happening and in a crowded marketplace, um, you know, it's hard to cut through. So for us, it was, it was the purpose piece, right? So we're doing this to raise money for UNICEF. And number two, we wanted to make sure we had all of our teams and drivers involved. So last Saturday, we had we had all of the 12 teams, 23 of our, our 24 drivers. One, uh, Sam Bird, we're going to get him some better internet connectivity so he can participate this weekend. Uh, and then the product itself, right? It's not just a one-off event. It's a nine-week series. And that that really was something we worked on with UNICEF. You know, how do we make sure we reinforce this message? Because the, the challenge with COVID is not, a, is not a March and an April issue. It's an ongoing issue. And so we wanted a series to be able to uh, to tell that story over time. That's really nice to hear. Um, Alejandro, virtual becoming so powerful. And if it's about raising awareness, then you have to consider virtual as well for your extreme E. I mean, certainly, because it just will enhance your reach. Have you got some ideas already on how you want to, uh, how you want to use that as well? Because extreme E is really to raise awareness for the environmental challenges coming up. Um, so have Absolutely. you got some ideas? Absolutely. Well, in, in extreme E, it's even more important because if you, if you think about it, extreme E has no spectators. Yeah. There is no people. There is no people at the races. It's a pure media product. And uh, on Extreme E, we need to, and what we're working on, and we will work on the virtual uh, races and so on when the races are going on, but what we're working on now is in making the race look almost like a video game, like you're watching the movie Tron. <laughs> so you will have, yeah, I mean, you will have all these virtual reality and augmented elements in the broadcasting it, when you see the car, you will have all this stuff that you will see, like uh, you know, in the screen, numbers and lines and and and, and arrows and uh, things that will be surrounding the adapting to the landscape and so on. All the advertising or most of the advertising is virtual. Also, we're not going to put a sign in the middle of the rainforest in the Amazon, big sign like this with our sponsor. It's going to be digital. It's going to be there and it's going to be cool and it's going to be integrated with you know the dunes or the the sea or the, the ice or whatever. So there is a lot of digital work going into the broadcasting of, uh, of, um, of Extreme. And then, of course, we'll have to do a lot of uh, things for the, for the fan engagement. We're looking also at really cool things. Like, for example, we're going to have this thing called, the, we're, we're fine tuning, but it's going to be called the Hyper Boost. And uh, it's going to be for the one who does the longest jump in the beginning. There's a jump <laughs> in the beginning. And then the one who got, does the longest jump gets a hyper boost and they start going super fast because the races are going to have four cars at the same time. So the four cars are going to go and then they jump and then whoever jumps faster, uh, longer goes faster. It's stuff like that. You know, we, we always come up with some interesting tweaks. 
That's cool. But you haven't gone to the Mario Kart level yet, huh? that people have to, with augmented reality, hit certain yet, credit, cool. credit uh, mushrooms in certain places. No, huh? well, that is Formula E. That is the, 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 um, the concept we have in Formula E with, uh, with uh, oh, no, uh, Jamie, I forgot the name now. The, with, um, Back motor fan boost. The, the, no, no. The, oh, the first one. You said it. I didn't hear it. Alejandro, you can see Alejandro is letting go, huh? I'm getting you, old. I'm getting old. No, I'm getting. I'm getting old. I'm getting old, guys. My brain doesn't work anymore. Anyway. Oh, but I, I think I what you, yeah, to your point, Nico. I think what you see is you, you, the fusion of the real and the virtual, and I think that's something that you know is is gonna you're gonna see more and more. And it's really cool with uh, with electric vehicles. The fact that you know the guys can give that extra energy just through a software update over the air. It's it's, it's pretty awesome. Attack uh, mode. Attack mode. Attack mode. That's Alejandro, I'm used to you being super quick. What's going on? I'm getting, I'm starting to be a bit worried. Lockdown is not treating you lockdown, well. Lo <laughs> lockdown, lockdown, is, <laughs> lockdown is killing me. <laughs> uh, Jamie, Jamie, what do you think uh, about the in impact on e-mobility now as a result of COVID? Do you think it is going to slow the transition? Do you think it's going to speed up the transition? What have you heard from from the manufacturers? I mean, you're working with all the biggest players in the world. What are you hearing? I think there's, uh, I think two sides of this. I mean, we touched on earlier, right? I think the impact that you've seen from uh, half of the world's population being at home, um, you've seen a massive reduction in emissions and pollution, right? So in terms of the, the, the main story around the importance of electric vehicles, to me, it couldn't be more, more important now. And people are really, to the extent that you needed further evidence, it's there and it's really strong. And so I think people's consciousness about not to be too philosophical, but their place in the world and, and their consciousness about how they can have an impact, I think is being raised too when, when they're forced to sit at home uh, like this. So I think, I think on the demand side, uh, I think it can only be good. On the, on the supply side, look, I mean, I think it does accelerate the need for the OEMs, the manufacturers to make the transition. But of course, you know, we can't, uh, we can't deny the realities of what the automotive industry is going through right now, just in terms of you know, complete shutdown of their supply chains, no demand, none of their uh, retail points are open. So I guess from, a, from an investment perspective, there's always the risk that, you know, R&D that might otherwise have happened in the next 12 months, does that get delayed a bit? But I view that as a small temporal shift. I think, I think the, mac, the macro trend is still very, very positive for, uh, for EVs. Yeah, so I've, I've spoken to one of the big players in Germany, and he said that before we reinvest and ramp up production for some old technology like a diesel or something, we're not doing that and we're just going more and more now on, on ramping up much more on the electric and speeding that up. So from, from what I heard, actually, uh, one of the big players who's also part of Formula E uh, was actually making that shift. And so in that sense, COVID, uh, for all the negative and, and sufferings that it's creating, which is terrible, but there are, of course, some, some benefits, um, uh, which, yeah. is, which is, of course, great. And, and you were saying, Jamie, um, that... Uh, that uh, um, yeah, and I mean, Alejandro, sorry to you. You said before that we shouldn't forget about climate change, but don't you think that actually maybe COVID could be an accelerator in the fight against climate change as well once it passes? Because now people are so conscious about how amazing it is in cities as well with 50% less, less pollution, no more noise and everything. Don't you think that gives us a, a more coming together and a joint target? Uh, which, which side are you on there? That, that has to be our objective. So we have to make sure that that happens. We have to make sure that COVID accelerates the fight against climate change, doesn't slow it down. And for that, the next month will be decisive because the world will be in front of a choice. They can choose to go to the back ways, which may be considered cheaper, or they have to choose to go to the future and to really take the, the right direction which may be considered to be more expensive, but it's not, because on the long term, it's gonna be a lot cheaper to do things right. Look what we are paying today, because we didn't prepare well. The, the price of climate change, if it happens, is gonna be 10 times the price of COVID, or 100 times the price of COVID. That's why, really, after these months of crisis, the world, when it faces a choice of going back or going to the future, we really need to make sure all of us that we are involved in this, in this, uh, uh, you know, let's call it movement or direction in, dif in our different capacities, we have to make sure we go in the right direction. But there is going to be the temptation to go back. Can you give an example? You say it might be 100 times more expensive than, than COVID. Give an example of such a cost that could accrue as you a know, result of uh, climate change. You know, uh, there are, for example, areas in the world 
where the average temperature may rise above 50 degrees. Because, of course, the average race, race goes up three or four degrees uh, in, 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 at the end of the century. That's the average. But the peak temperatures in some areas in the summer is going to go above 50 degrees, making them uninhabitable. Some areas in South Asia, for example, in, in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. That means millions of people, millions of people could die. We are having a huge crisis where maybe a couple hundred thousand people are going to die or, or maybe half a million people are going to die and the world has come to a stop. We are talking many, many millions of people that could be affected directly by the rise of temperature in some areas of the world. They will not be able to live there anymore. That's a very specific example. I'm not talking of cities being flooded uh, because of the rise of the sea level, which will also happen and so on and so forth. Imagine if we lose a whole city or two whole cities. Imagine or three whole cities like Miami or like New York. That is huge. We are seeing now the impact that staying at home for a month has, and it's almost putting the world economy on its knees. The impact of climate change, if we don't really prepare it soon, is going to be far bigger. I just spoke to, uh, to Satguru, who's going to be uh, my next guest after you, actually, uh, on this Leaders for, for Good. And he's also very, very worried because in India, uh, he's witnessing how the drought drought is just coming at such an alarming rate and precisely because of that reason that you just mentioned. So he's also supporting, uh, supporting, uh, trying to support a lot with, uh, with the reforestation and all these kind of things to try and help uh, fight, fight the drought. So it's the same, same topic as you mentioned. Um, my goodness, huh? very pressing, pressing times for us all in, in, in these various... Uh, but again, it's an opportunity, like you say, it could be an opportunity to tell people really look what happens Let's go in the right direction. So COVID can be a huge opportunity, like a huge lesson to go in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. I, think, I think people are much more aware of the issues and I think consciously willing to listen. And, you know, maybe that's a small sample set of my, you know, personal network, but it feels like people are being more introspective about their impact. And so we have mm -hmm. that combined with the evidence and that gives you the momentum that Alejandro is talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly there's a much stronger feeling of togetherness and of, of caring, huh? That's been uh, extremely powerful through this time, and I'm sure some of that re will remain afterwards, which is a great opportunity. Um, Alejandro, just finally, with, uh, with QAV Tech, you also, you're, you've been developing some ventilators running on battery power. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick overview. I mean, great project. Um, sound, sounds awesome yes. and, and special. Yeah, it's a fantastic project. So QAV is one of our teams in Extreme, and they are a technology company based out of Barcelona. And together with these doctors in Spain, you know, Barcelona got very, all of Spain has got very heavily hit by COVID. And uh, Barcelona especially, they were in really in big need of ventilators. Uh, this is invasive ventilators, the ones that go on in, inside you on your lungs. Uh, the ones that are being produced by Formula One are positive pressure ventilators that give oxygen to your mouth. For That's for less serious cases. But when you're really sick, you need an invasive ventilator. So they developed this ventilator with the hospital of Barcelona with San Pao, uh, and uh, it's great. It's, it's now uh, being uh, authorized for use in Spain. So it's being used in uh, all the hospitals in Catalonia with, the, with, uh, with patients, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's saving lives there. Um, so that's great credit to QEV. But then uh, with Extreme, we are looking at the places where we race uh, and trying to help them. And uh, we are in touch with uh, Pará, with the governor of Pará in Brazil. Actually, I just got a message while I was uh, talking to you that the ventilator got through the U.S. customs. We, we had to send it with DHL and it had to stop in U.S. And actually in U.S. they kind of kept it for a few days. Uh, we were afraid they were going to keep it. But now it's finally gone through. So it's on its way to Brazil. They're gonna, they have to homologate it there. So go through the process to, to, make it, to make sure it works for Brazil. Once that's through, we have the capacity to make over 100 ventilators uh, uh, a day. So we will be sending those to Brazil, uh, especially to the areas. This ventilator has a battery. So it works in remote areas, in field hospitals and so on. So we're going to be sending them to the Amazon region where it's, you know, COVID is really affecting a lot of people in the Amazon and they're very unprotected. And the hospitals, they need to be field hospitals in the middle of nowhere. So, so we're, we're hopefully sending them there. Hopefully we can, we can help them. That sounds amazing. I hope the homologation goes, uh, goes quick then. Really cool how you can have so much impact then as well in, in those developing countries. Um, my first guest was Lucas, your, your driver. And, uh, yes. and he's also trying to, trying to have incredible impact because he's, um, he's deploying or testing at the moment UV, uh, UV radiation uh, to kill off uh, coronaviruses in, uh, in public transport systems. Huh? So he's in the process of testing that now and, and also there it would be amazing. So, um, so really great stuff. Um, 
No, that's it really. I mean, thank you very much uh, for the time you've taken. Um, it was good. It's good to see you always. Yeah, too bad to for, the, for this year in Berlin. Eh? We would, it would have been good to be to be to do part two of uh, of your festival. Last yeah, year was I amazing. Know. I know, I know. It was such a great start last year. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we'll talk for next year, obviously, very very soon. We'll do it with then... more energy next year, and we will have even more relevance, like we were talking about. More energy is difficult. Then I need to then I need to consider a little bit my health because. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, were, we were quite running on the rev limiter already last year and even at the moment, as you can very much imagine, being an event. Um, so uh, I think more, more is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, thank good. you very much, Jamie. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, good luck, of course, with everything. Uh, Jamie, I'm looking forward to the first race. I think that would help us all so much, uh, being stuck at home or uh, to have some action and entertainment on TV. So I really hope you can get something going uh, very, very quickly. All right, okay. so we'll work Thank as hard as we can. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Bye-bye.